when you get uh, increasingly now in the uh, in England and in the other countries as well, but particularly in England with the onset of the genomic laboratory hubs, we're trying to move to the point where lung cancer patients routinely are getting next generation sequencing reports. And these are very different from clinicians uh, from the old days where we used to get one or two genes which might have been analyzed either by a single gene test or by immunohistochemistry. Uh, so you'll now get a uh, hopefully a more comprehensive report, uh, including all the biomarkers that ha- can help us guide the care of our, our patients with lung cancer. Um, but some of those, uh, excuse me, uh, but um, you know, some clinicians may not be used to uh, reading these reports. They may find them quite confusing and, and not know how to uh, integrate them into the care of the patient. So uh, what I've suggested in my presentation is a sort of stepwise uh, approach, into, which is the approach that I use uh, when I'm reading a next generation sequencing report. Uh, so the first thing is to do is to is see what's been done uh, with its tumor or increasingly some patients will be having, having blood done through circulating free DNA analysis. The next point uh, after that is to try and work out, and this, I think this is the most difficult bit, is what's driving the patient's cancer forward. Because what you're hoping by doing these uh, panel testing is that you can identify something that might enable a treatment for your patient, uh, either through the NHS or, or potentially through a clinical trial. So what you want to do then is to uh, 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 try and identify the driver, work out if it's one driver, uh, so for classic examples of that are the single genes that we used to test, such as EGFR or ALK, and there's a, a, a number coming through that we may want to talk about. Uh, but often in, in, in lung cancer, it may be, may be more than one. There may be two, three, four, uh, maybe even more drivers. And so trying to work out uh, exactly how many drivers there are, which ones there are, and, and whether they're important. Once you've worked out the driver, um, and, and often the laboratory will help you with this. They, they'll tell you whether the mutation is, is pathogenic, i.e. actually affects protein function. They'll tell you whether it's previously been reported in, in, in lung cancer or not. Um, then you need to work out if it's actionable. Um, so by actionable, we basically mean what I was saying earlier, you know, can you take that patient's genetic profile and can you match it up to a treatment, either standard of care or, or, or clinical trial? And, and there's a number of resources that you can use out there. So um, ESMO have produced this sort of tiering where, you know, something that's high, tiered highly, tier one, may enable uh, access to 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 treatment within the uh, NHS or with a licensed drug, and then moving down to sort of two or three where it's far more far more exploratory, uh, but where you might want to try something within a clinical trial if, if you can find one appropriately. Um, within the presentation, uh, I, I try to outline where there's a number of resources that people can potentially use. So um, in terms of trying to work out whether the mutation is a driver, there's a number of online databases that you can use. Uh, CIVID is one, um, but there's a number of others out there, Clinivar. Um, so I've, I've, I've highlighted people to those. And they can help you uh, identify what the consequence of the mutation is. Uh, but also whether it's been well reported in lung cancer before, you know, if you're seeing a mutation that's very common in lung cancer, it's more likely that it's a driver. And if it's known to be a driver, then a very rare thing. But we do see rare things occasionally. Um, uh, so, so that's one resource. And then in terms of actionability, there's also resources for that. So there's uh, websites like Onco KB, um, but a lot of these are run from uh, America. Onco uh, KB is run by the MD Anderson. Um, a number of them um, require uh, money. Uh, sorry. A number of them require licenses to allow full access to the databases, but in particular, because they're based around the the American environment, that uh, when they're talking about licensed therapies, they may not be applicable in the UK, uh, and particularly when they're talking about trials. So if you are thinking about whether your patient might be suitable for a trial, um, there's some UK resources out there. Uh, So there's CIUK have a trials finder, which is open open to the public, um, and you can find uh, through through the internet very easily. But the 
ECSC Network, the Experimental Cancer Medicine Center Network, has recently launched a, a trial finder. Uh, now, this is just for oncologists. Um, and the reason why that is, is that it's got our own emails and telephone number in it. So it's, if somebody finds a trial, it's very easy for them to get in contact with the investigator. But there's understandably concerns about putting everyone's email and telephone number into the public domain. But the advantages are that it's it's very much based around what trials are up and running in the UK, including some of the early clinical trials that may not be on the big international databases, such as clinicaltrials.gov, or it may not be clear from clinicaltrials.gov that they go for a particular patient population, you know, for a particular biomarker. So uh, that should hopefully be a, a really good resource for, for people going forward.